children excitedly began to look for a granddad, you know, the old man image of gray hair, slow walk, outdated clothes image, the images we have of granddads. They had not been prepared to see a spry, cool dude with a gold chain, red athletic wear with matching shoes, sunglasses, and a stride like Denzel Washington in the movie Malcolm. Rael chuckled with delight as one of the children turned to her and exclaimed, Mom, that is your dad? Dad. However, there is no testament of his love of children greater than the responsiveness of his children as they collectively rush to his side during his precious final hours. They gathered together from California, Georgia, Tennessee, and his Huntsville hometown. The telling of tales, hilarity, tears, hugs, and emotions created a bonding experience that shall forever remain a legacy tribute in their treasure chest of memories. There was no rivalry, no competition, no half-sisters, no half-brothers, just seven siblings with nothing between them except love, caring, sharing, and kinship. The only void that exists is that of their free-spirited Ashley, who was 8,576 miles away in Johannesburg, South Africa, far too many miles and far too far away with so little time to bridge such an expanse. The children gathered not only together, but created a space in the center of their circle to surround their father's beloved wife, Pinky, with their support, their kindness, and their comfort. They did this so that Pinky would not be alone. Rael, the eldest, did not return home to her husband and four children in California. She lingered to be near Pinky. Christian, the youngest, offered reassurances that she, Pinky, should not worry nor want for anything during their bereavement period. They were full of decisions, they were running errands, accepting responsibilities and expenses. The others echoed his sentiments with, we got this. Matthew, uncertain yes, yet eager to share, offered to lend his voice as spokesperson before all those present here today on behalf of their seven siblings. Now folks, I might get some of these names a little wrong, but you have your bulletin. So look, Shaniqua, Rael, Session, Bree, Ekcha, Barrera, Chancellor Sims, Edward Earl Cleveland II, Ashley Cleveland, Omar Cleveland, Clifford, Omar Clifford Cleveland, Matthew Lewis McCall Cleveland, and Christian Tyler Cleveland. Let's just call them Earl's Pride. Love of a woman. Earl and Pinky Benita Davis were married for 17 years. His father, Elder E.E. E. Cleveland, commended her not only for the care and love she showed on his son, that she showered and showed on his son, but also for the love, care, support, kindness, and comfort she showed towards him. 
And I remember at Elder E.E. E. Cleveland's funeral, President Ben Jones said of, Cle of Pinky, she did what she could. I remember that. He left instructions that she was to be recognized during the celebration of his life for her Martha Dorcas Samaritan spirit. Pinky understood and practiced the principles of unconditional love. And through those principles, her marriage to Earl was sustained. Pinky and Earl's was Earl's love, his lover, his wailing wall, and his best friend. She was his everyday sidekick, her. Everything we did, we did together. Earl was a complex, complicated, troubled soul and the funniest man many of us have ever known with a big heart, big enough to always have room to embrace just one more. And this was penned by Pinky Davis Cleveland. Dearest Earl, my dearest Earl, I held a flower in my hand. I peeled back its petals, discovered its true beauty, and buried deep within, it touched my heart. In that moment, you became my whole world. Earl will leave a hole in the hearts of a host of grandchildren, cousins, children, friends, schoolmates, and old running buddies. The scriptures say that one day a voice sweeter than any voice that has ever fallen on human ears will say to each of us, come, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit a place prepared for you before the foundation of the world. It is my prayer and the prayer of the Cleveland family that each of us will hear that call and respond. Thank you. Pinky, and to the family, I want to thank you for allowing, allowing me to come and minister to you today. Um, as is well noted, Earl is the son of Dr. E.E. E. Cleveland, who is the brother to Elder W.J. Cleveland, and the brother to the younger Dr. H.L. Cleveland. I am here representing the H.L. Cleveland family and my family sends their love and comfort and condolences to you at this time. We know <laughs> that uh, what Earl meant to you and, and we hope that we will all live so that we will meet him again in the earth made new. Dr. Osterman and I have uh, put a medley together and we hope that it will minister to you today.
Hello, I'm Dr. Carlton Bird, and I'm privileged to serve as the president of the Southwest Region Conference with headquarters in Dallas, Texas. 
But before my time here in Dallas at the Southwest Region Conference, I was privileged to serve as the pastor of the Oakwood University Church. While at the Oakwood University Church, I had the privilege of pastoring the Cleveland family. To Sister Pinky, to the children of Earl Cleveland, and the entire family, know that Danielle and I and our daughters, Kristen, Kaylee, and Carissa, we love you and we're praying for you. I regret that I cannot be with you today, but know that my heart is with you. We're gonna miss Earl. I can see him right now driving up under the underpass at the Oakwood University Church to pick you up, Pinky, when you were serving at the church, whether it was food and dinners, whether it was picking up your grandchildren, I can see him right now with that smile waving at me. We're praying for you and know that God will be with you during this period. We've all heard it before, we've preached it, we've taught it, that Jesus Christ is coming soon and death one day will be dead. There'll be no more crying, no more sickness, no more pain. The former things will all be passed away and all things will become new. Like you, I look forward to that day. But until then, hold fast and know that a better day is coming after a while. Jesus is coming back. Those who have fallen asleep in him will rise first. And then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Pinky, children, grandchildren, extended family, and the church family. Let's be ready for that day. May God bless you, is my prayer. Let the church say amen. At this time, we will call forward Brother Stephen Foster, um, who will be our next reflection here at the mic station on the floor to my right, to your left. Also, I want to invite Sister Carol Ward-Moore to begin making her way uh, down here to the front row as well. And so after Stephen shares his reflection, there will be a video by Brother Russell Patterson, and then we'll conclude this group of reflect reflections with Miss Carol Wardmore. Thank you, uh, and family, I want to thank you for this opportunity to uh, speak on behalf of uh, my friend. And, uh, you know, he, uh, he's, he's the only guy I think that I could imitate. And uh, he used to tell me, he said, uh, you represent us, mine. <laughs> and uh, so I would like to uh, speak on behalf of uh, his classmates, schoolmates, friends, running buddies, etc. cetera. Uh, I'm gonna have to read this because if I don't, I might not, I might not get through it and I might not get through it anyway. Um, well, I'm just, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just, I can't read it, I gotta say it. Uh, me and Earl started our friendship at about the age of 12 years old uh, at Victory Lake Camp. Uh, he, was a, he was a catcher and I was the third baseman on our softball teams. And uh, later uh, we got together at Pine Forge where we were fierce competitors um, in everything sports-wise. Uh, life is funny because uh, we ended up down here and my father and his father ended up down here as fierce competitors on the golf course every Monday uh, when I'd call uh, my father, he would just tell me, you know, I beat Cleve today, or whatever. That was, that was like the whole thing. 
And so it's just funny how life replicates because that's the way Earl and I were. Now, uh, I think if Earl had his way, he would have me testify uh, the truth about his athletic ability. <laughs> and uh, so I'm, I'm going to tell you the truth. Um, Earl could really hoop. I mean, he, Earl was the truth. Uh, I would never tell him that in person, <laughs> but uh, he, was, he was the real deal, I'm telling you. Earl was, uh, you know, uh, I used to take pride in, in trying to check him. Um, you know, I made him work, but the dude was unstoppable. He had what we used to call uh, inside the gym range. So in other words, any shot inside the gym that he took was a good shot. <laughs> uh, he was like Steph Curry and Damon Lillard before the three-point shot was popular. Uh, you know, as the years progressed, uh, we kind of drifted apart. Um, I spent my senior, I'm sorry, my first year out of Oakwood in Washington, D.C., and pretty much every weekend, <laughs> uh, I would be over at Earl's and we'd be watching games and having fun and whatnot. But then uh, life progressed and uh, I moved to the Midwest and, you know, marriages and, and family and what have you. But uh, uh, we ended up down here as our parents did. And uh, we never lost the connection. We always had that connection. And uh, Earl uh, was a caring guy. He was a very caring guy. Um, he kind of gave you that tough persona, but he really was a caring, a caring guy. I know he used to visit my, uh, my wife uh, in the hospital down the stretch. You know, without saying anything, he would just, you know, come and visit her, and she would tell me Earl was here. And uh, he wouldn't even say anything. He wouldn't tell me. He would just, you know, but he was that kind of guy. Um, uh, you know, Proverbs 22, 6 says, uh, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Uh, but I, I think that's true, obviously, but I think it's true because if you train up a child in the way he should go, when he is old, it will not depart from him. And uh, no matter what, when, when a child is trained up in the, in the household he was trained in, you know, and your, your mind, there's an implant in your mind. <laughs> There's, a, there's an imprint on your conscious, your subconscious, that you cannot get out, no matter how hard you try. And um, Earl uh, was complicated. He, he had uh, insecurities. Um, he, had, uh, he, has, he struggled with doubt. And uh, uh, so I ran into him about six weeks ago at a convenience store, and we ex exchanged pleasantries. And, uh, but then about three weeks ago, uh, he called me. And uh, he was struggling with some things that he wanted to uh, have reconciled in his mind. And uh, we talked and talked and talked, um, you know. And at some point, he said, don't yell at me, man. <laughs> because I was getting a little animated in the discussion, but it was a very heavy conversation. And uh, <laughs> okay, it was a very heavy conversation. And anyway, uh, uh, he, was, he expressed some frustration about Jesus not coming back yet. And he was concerned about the troubles in the world and what have you. And he was concerned about that. He was frustrated about it. 
And uh, so, you know, we, we talked and then, you know, it, it, it dawned on me um, when I heard that he passed that Jesus came for Earl three weeks ago, uh, or last week, last week. And it was the Holy Spirit, I'm convinced, that prompted him to call me. Um, I'm convinced of that because of this, the way the discussion went and, you know, I ended up telling him, I ended up asking him, I said, what are the chances that the people who chose you, the family that chose you, what were the chances of that happening? And uh, he had to acknowledge that yeah, I had a point. He, he said, he said, you have a point, man. And so, uh, you know, God knows everything. The most important thing is that I think Earl's life testified that the most important thing that we can learn is that God loves us so much. I mean, that's the most important thing that we can, we can learn. And uh, his mercy and his grace is bigger than we can imagine. And, you know, I'm convinced that God never left Earl because, you know, he, he called me to talk about God three weeks ago. And uh, so family, um, be strong. And uh, Pinky, I want to thank you for being a phenomenal wife, a phenomenal wife. And uh, uh, our prayers and our, our love are with you. Good day. Uh, my name is Russell Patterson. and. Uh, this is a sad occasion, but I uh, just want to talk a little bit about an uh, old friend of mine, Earl Cleveland. Um, we kind of grew up a little bit together in Washington, D.C. I stayed at his house and spent a night with him, and he's done the same with me. Uh, we went to DuPont. Um, we played on... Uh, Tacoma Academy's uh, basketball team. Uh, he was a shooting guard. I was the uh, point guard. And uh, what I'm trying to say is we've had a relationship for a very, for a very, very long time. And uh, uh, they left uh, Washington, D.C. And uh, when I became uh, the dean uh, at Oakwood University, um, Holland Hall, um, we uh, reconnected, um, physically reconnected. We already always stayed, kind of stayed connected um, at, uh, by, by phone. Um, but uh, I used to go by um, his place, um, and I guess Pinky probably was tired of seeing me, you know, uh, and by the way, I just wanted to say that, uh, he really, 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 really loved Pinky, and Pinky really loved him. Um, Earl and I used to go, uh, drink coffee together, have breakfast, uh, he used to come by my house, come by the dorm, Holland Hall, and, uh, uh, we went, used to go to the gym. Um, just We just picked up sort of much where we left off at when uh, we used to hang out in Washington, D.C. as kids. Uh, Earl Cleveland uh, was a excellent basketball player, a, I should say, outstanding basketball player, um, and he could dress... Um, he had a, a, a specific style about him that, uh, uh, you know, that he created, which was uh, uh, not necessarily unique, but uh, he could, uh, he knew fashion, let me say that, he knew fashion. And, um, uh, and then I remember when we were younger, he had this large afro, and it had gray in it, and when when we would play ball, he'd run up and down and caught his head with with uh, blowing the wind, and the the honeys loved him. 
I mean, you know, and a lot of guys, you know, didn't like Earl because I'm thinking they were jealous of Earl because, you know, he was he he was an athlete and he was he was just an all around type guy. But uh you know, this is a it's, it's, it's not a very happy occasion. Um but we do believe um in the Lord and his second coming and um you know it's I don't know, you know, words are kinda hard to, to 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 come by, but he was a very good friend of mine. And Earl Cleveland, um we kind of hung out in the same circles. You know, I was also, uh, you know, the dean of Pine Forge, and he used to ask me because he went to Pine Forge, but you know he got kicked out of just about every Adventist program uh, that he went to, you know, and I did too. So, you know, we both got kicked out. But I just want to say and, and say that um, uh, Earl will be truly missed. And... Um, I loved him as a friend. It's nothing I wouldn't do for him. And Pinky, um, if there's anything you need, uh, please don't hesitate to give me a call. And uh, I just want to say that uh, for all those who are listening to this, uh, thank God that we have uh, a promise that the Lord is coming to get us. You all have a good one. And ciao. It's been nice. Good morning. I'm Carolyn Ward Moore, eldest daughter of Eric C. Ward. Um, that's how I got to be here today because Earl's dad was the mentor of my dad. Everybody knows that E.E. -E and E.C. were close. We also had Warren Banfield, who was my dad's roommate at PUC. And when it came time for them to start their ministry, they were sent to Elder E.E. E. Cleveland, and they went south. That's where the time was to be. It was our mission field. It wasn't too long after we entered the south and the mission field that I was born and my siblings were born. I'm a bit older than Earl, but I just remember that cute little boy with curly hair. Uh, in those days, we call that good hair. <laughs> and he was feisty. He had a lot of fun. And my brothers were along with that same kind of game. Um, our highlight was coming south and then coming to Oakwood when we were kids, it was just grand, it was big. And I remember saying, when I grow up, I'm gonna go to Oakwood. And I chose my roommate when I was 11 years old. And we said, when we grow up, we're coming to Oakwood to be roommates, and we did. But Earl was um, the kind of guy that you knew, you knew what he liked, you knew what he didn't like. You knew what he meant, and you knew what he didn't mean. He was good looking out for others. And he had a, a spirit that was just uh, encapsulating, just really himself. His collection of Cadillacs was something that I think my father would have even uh, kind of admired because they were both Cadillac guys. I would say that he married the sweetest lady that he could find around. And it's our secret as to what I said when she told me they had gotten married. And she, she shouldn't have told me in the hallway out here in the church because I could just be myself. And we smiled today as to how our little secret went because she was really a blushing bride. She told me after the fact, which is fine. She didn't ask permission. She just went ahead and did what she needed to do. Pinky. 
She's never changed. She's a kind, loving, giving to a fault person. She's loyal and just loving. Her parents were people that we enjoyed too. Our families enjoyed each other. Fest Reynolds, he was an educator. He came across as stern, but he really was caring and had a good spirit. Her mom, Mrs. Reynolds, was a loving mother with a gentle spirit pretty much like Pinkies. So this, these families all got together. Warren Banfield's widow is a member of this church. And we love her and remember her and the roommates were all proud of being a part of E.E. E. Cleveland's team. We wanna thank God for those connections that we'll never ever forget. So Earl was popular, he was looking out Preacher's kids, any preacher's kids in the audience today? Yeah, okay. preacher's kids and the pressures of preacher's kids. We wouldn't wish that on anybody. I, th <laughs> I will say that no matter how it goes, we've looked at three generations of family. We've looked at the parents, our parents together. We've looked at us kids together. And now our grandkids are friends. They're academy students, elementary students, and so the beat goes on. I want to say this in closing that, Pinky, God says you're beautiful in Psalms 45:11. God says you're strong in Philippians 4:13. God says you're amazing in Psalms 189, verse 14. God says, you're never alone, kids. Your grandfather, you're just never alone without him. You're chosen, 1 Thessalonians 1, 4. And you're always loved, Romans 8, 38. And I saw this quote for the first time last night. And it says, if anyone has anything to say about my past, just tell them that Jesus Drop the charges. He's paid it all. I hear the sound of a mighty rushing wind, and it's closer now than it's ever been. I can almost Hear the trumpet as Gabriel sounds the call, at the midnight cry will be going home I looked around me I see prophecies fulfilled everywhere and the signs of the times they're appearing everywhere oh i can almost see the father as he say son go and get my 
children Oh, at the midnight cry That of Christ will rise When Jesus steps out On a crowd of all his children The dead in Christ will rise To meet him in the air And then those that remain Shall, shall be quickly changed Changed in a moment At the midnight around me I see prophecies fulfilled every day and the signs of the times they're appearing everywhere oh I can almost see the Father Children, oh, it's the midnight cry. The bride of Christ will rise when Jesus steps out on a cloud for his children. Let the church say amen again. Thank you, Sister Daly. My goodness. 
One of the interesting things when you come to an event like this, I listened to Stephen Foster talk, and uh, I looked out on the audience and I see um, members of some of the legendary families of the Seventh-day Adventist ministry. Um, Batsons and Hills and Coopwoods and Booths. And they are reflective of the generation that was older than Earl. But there are some inside stories and whenever I see reflections, I like to think of them as inside stories. And at this time, we're going to have reflections, inside stories from Earl's children at this time. Is there a spokesman or a group? All right. Your choice. I have a lot of inside, but we can't talk. You about wouldn't that. want to come here. I can. I'm good right here. You all right? So, like I said, I have a lot of inside stories. I don't think the pastor wants me to share those. So, we'll talk about that after the service. Um, well, I'm Matthew, lucky number seven of eight wonderful children. Um, I just want to start off by thanking all my siblings um, for allowing me to speak for us. It's a lot to choose from, so. I'm appreciative of the, the opportunity. So when you have eight kids, you're bound to be at odds with one of them, at least, right? Well, with my dad, it was more like two, three, or four. So uh, unfortunately, I was one of those. Um, tomorrow's not promised. Unfortunately, we didn't know that day was upon us until that day was upon us. Um, and when you're put in that kind of moment, you're faced with the type of fear regret, you don't get that forgiveness, you don't get to talk to that loved one, and when it's apparent, it hits a little harder. Um, so when we arrived there, it was an ugly scene, it didn't look too good, but just after a couple hours of talking, touching, kissing, apologizing, our father took a tremendous turn. He was moving his fingers, his feet, squeezing the nurse's hands, taking commands, giving a thumbs up, opening his eyes, looking at us, so that fear quickly turned into joy joy that we knew our dad was good, he could hear us, he forgave us, and he was at peace, and so were we. Um, our dad was a lot of things, he was a lot of things. When he was bad, he was bad, but when he was good, he was the best, and there's no one that can compare it to him. Um, one of the things that I'll always remember of him, his humor. He was a hilarious man, I think all my siblings can attest to that. He was the kind of guy that when you would go see him or talk to him on the phone, you know it's gonna be crazy. You know it's gonna be something. Um, we would talk and I wouldn't really remember the conversations because I would just laugh the whole time. So much to the point my face would hurt. He was that kind of guy. Um, he was very charismatic, very likable. I mean, you couldn't help but to like the guy. You just loved him when he was good, you know? <laughs> I mean, he could talk to anyone. I've seen, like, anyone. I promise you, I kid you not, my dad could talk to a brick wall and the wall would talk back just because he was that kind of guy. Um, and like everyone alluded to earlier, everybody knows my dad loves his Cadillac. Like, he loved it. Rain, sleet, or snow, he's going to be outside wiping down that Cadillac. I mean, his neighbors probably thought he was crazy, but his car looked nice. I mean, if he doesn't call you for anything, he's going to call you and talk about that Cadillac. Like, Pops, I'm not trying to hear all that right now. Um, but Pinky, I guess she did a good job of holding the car down and wiping it because he didn't get up. And I'm pretty sure he would have got up and said something if he didn't wipe it the right way. Um, I don't really have a lot to say because it's like, what, what can you really say? It's, it's a hard thing. But in closing, I just would like to say, if anyone should ever write my life story, for whatever reason there might be, you will be there between each line of pain and glory for you're the best thing that's ever happened to me. Thank you.
Let the church say amen again. This time we will have a pictorial tribute. Um, and then that will be followed by a video selection, a, a song and ministry by Elder Wintley Phipps. And then we will receive our message of hope by Pastor Stephen Norman.
thief lay dying on a cross and he knew all along that he had done wrong and now for his sin he must die but as he turned he saw the Christ with his blood flowing down he knew he had found the one who could save his soul so he cried Remember me when you come into your kingdom, oh Lord. Remember me when you talk to your father and tell him that I know I'm not been all he wants me to be, but in mercy. See, now I plead, Lord, please remember me. Then Jesus said, have no fear, son, you shall be with me. Eternally, it is for you that I die. And now I know Christ, He lives again, and He stands all alone before the white throne with his own righteous life he covers mine so now i cry remember me when you come into your kingdom oh lord remember me when you talk to your father and tell him that i know i'm not been all he wants me to be, but in mercy now I plead, Lord, please remember me, remember me when you come into your kingdom, oh Lord, remember me when you Talk to your father and tell him that I know I've not been all he wants me to be. But in mercy now I plead, Lord, please remember me. Remember. Remember me, won't you please remember me? Shaniqua, Bray, Chancellor, Edward, Ashley, if you're watching, Omar, Matthew, Christian, relatives and friends. Occasions like this are almost always difficult. But they are possible. 
because of Jesus and the Father who cares. Even now, angels are walking between you to give you strength. You felt the strength so far, and you're going to continue to experience it. Pinky, we go all the way back to elementary. <laughs> but in recent years, I've observed your care, your love, your commitment, not only to Earl, but to his father. Sometimes we would be at his father's house the same time. We've had many, several times when we've just been together and I've seen that your work, your care will be rewarded. And God hears the prayers that you pray in your prayer closet. And I just want to say to Steve Foster and to Carolyn Moore, what you said was very meaningful among the others. But Stephen, I've sat with many people in their terminal days and have heard the conversations. And I've come to believe that the Holy Spirit comes in and moves in ways that are unseen to us. And right then, Jesus, as they by faith receive and accept, Jesus turns around and in the words of O'Neill, of the O'Neill twins, And it's my favorite song, Carolyn. Jesus drops the charges. And uh, that gives us hope. Because when Jesus drops the charges, they hit a home run in the last inning. Let us pray. Father, you said, the Lord is near. We feel your presence near, and we know that your coming is near. You said that when we pray that you would give us a peace that passes all understanding. I thank you that right now you are giving this family peace and strength, comfort, and hope. In Jesus' name, speak through me, but to them. Amen. My family, as other families that are here, have been around the Cleveland and Reynolds family for three generations. My mother lived in the Cleveland home, the home of W.C. Cleveland, shortly after she left college. She was a schoolmate of Hortense Reynolds. The Abneys, where my grandparents pastor down in Miami, Florida. It was there that Celia and my mother at the age of 16 became friends. We have seen each, each other go through various experiences. We've learned from each other and today I just want to share with you 
some of the lessons that I learned from your ancestors that will help you today. I want to just share them under the text from Psalm 145, verses 3 to 4, that says, The Lord is great and highly praised. His greatness is unsearchable. One generation will declare your works to the next and will proclaim your mighty acts. One generation will declare your works to the next and will proclaim your mighty acts. God tells each generation to share stories of how he helped the former generation because these stories of faith, these stories about God help us know God, the God of our ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These faith stories also help us, help these faith stories of how God helped former generations transmit and develop generational faith in the next generation. And when we see how God helped them through tough times, we glean comfort, encouragement, and hope for our tough times. And so today I just want to share three lessons that I learned from the former generations. Number one, grass grows when it is bruised. I took biology from Professor Reynolds. He said that when he was in school, that George Washington Carver taught him that walking on grass helps it grow. As long as you don't walk on it too much. I did some research on that recently and found out that when you walk on grass, just as when you mow grass, it breaks it and when it is bruised, as it grows back, it makes its roots grow deeper and it makes those roots spread so that the grass becomes stronger. And as it spreads, it resists weeds. And soon, it's dominant. Alan Hurt, a lawn care expert, says the more you mow, the healthier your lawn will grow. That's because that mowing stimulates the turf to spread roots, get thick, and grow tall again. God's purpose, plan, and providence allows life's events to bruise us. He allows it so that we can grow. God allowed Jesus to be bruised. Jesus was bruised for our iniquities so that he could destroy the death the devil, sin, and death. Hebrews says he learned obedience through the things he suffered. When he was bruised, he learned obedience. God allows us to be bruised. Many things will cause our hearts to be bruised. Death bruises us. Suffering bruises us. Relationships can bruise us. The lack of relationships can bruise us. Sin bruises us, but all of them can help us grow. Two things to know. God feels your bruises, and God will help you grow through your bruises. Some years ago, after I experienced a particularly bruising time, I was walking through a park, and I noticed grass, some grass was short. Some grass that had been 
mowed maybe a month or so before, was taller, and then there was other grass that was very tall. I had been praying that God would show me something in, in, during my walk that morning, and when I saw that, God revealed to me that no matter how many times life mows you down, no matter how, how low life cuts you, you can grow again. As long as you keep yourself rooted in the soil and in the word, as long as you draw from that the water of the Holy Spirit and bask in the sun of Christ's righteousness, you can grow again. No power on earth can keep you down. You can and will rise again. Friend, remember the lesson of Professor Reynolds. Grass grows when it is bruised. Lesson two, find comfort in prayer and the Bible. In one of my visits to other Cleveland, E.E. E. Cleveland, after your grandmother, your great-grandmother, Celia Cleveland, had died, he said, you know, Steve, in the mornings I get up and I go down to the Oakwood Cemetery, walk over to my wife's grave, clean the bird droppings off of her, off of her stone, Thank the Lord for the years of marriage he gave us. The things that she meant to me. How she helped me. He says, then I turn around and go home and pray and study my Bible. He knew the power of prayer. And I witnessed the power of of his prayers. In Birmingham, I watched as a storm shook the tent that we, that we had down there in 1975. Pole, the pole was shaking. He grabbed the pole, leaned into that pole, then looked up and rebuked the storm in the name of Jesus. And immediately, the rain stopped. The wind stood still. The poles went back into their spots. And when I saw it, I saw what happens when you know God and when you know how to pray. In Nashville, after his 1990 evangelistic meeting, a young lady came to to me and asked me, would you ask Elder Cleveland to pray for me? She was 29. She had breast cancer. Nobody in her family survived breast cancer. A number of her aunts and relatives died. She knew it was a sure death, death, death sentence. She says, I don't want to die. I went to the Cleveland and asked him if he would pray for her. That next Sunday, the two of us met behind the tent and we prayed for her. That was Sunday. Thursday, she called me and said, Pastor Norman, something strange just happened to me. She told me what had happened and her body had ejected the cancer. Literally, we ejected it. She said, what do I do? She, I said, go to the doctor and let him confirm it. Let him give you an antibiotic because you've got an open wound and I want, he needs to see what God can do. She went to the doctor. He told her that, it, that what had happened was so he marveled at what God could do and gave her something 
a medication to take care of it. On another occasion, my son, Stephen, was rushed to surgery three times with a hemorrhaging duodenum, with a duodenal hemorrhage. On the third time, I called Elder Cleveland and asked him to pray. He prayed. I simply told him he was sick and in surgery. But Elder Cleveland prayed to the God of Lazarus. I looked at my wife. I said, he, I didn't tell him he was dead. We trembled. He never prayed a prayer that I heard over 60 seconds. He prayed, got off the phone, and as soon as we got off the phone, the surgeon is coming down and she told us, we lost your son, but he's back. When we looked and talked with her, he came back at the time Elder Cleveland was praying. He knew how to pray. His prayer power came from daily, moment-by-moment -moment faith relationship with God. And day by day, he prayed and meditated on scripture verses that would help him. You can have the same power through a close relationship with God. Bible study also helped him through life. Every moment, every morning, he studied and prayed the scriptures. One time he asked me, Steve, I need a computer. I said, what do you want on the computer? Do you want Microsoft Word on it? Nope. Do you want Word Perfect on it? Nope. All I want on it is Bible software. I went down there to his home before he moved to the towers here and installed the software, set up his computer. When I got it set up, he said, now show me how to get to the verses that I needed. He gave me two verses. He said, I read these every morning. I and then as he read them, he not only read them, he prayed through them and broke down in tears as he read how God had blessed David and taken him to the, to the kingship and how God took him from pushing a, a snowball cart through the, through the streets of Chattanooga to, a preach, to the place where he had preached around the world. Then he wept. And I simply sat there quiet because I knew I was in a sacred space. You can pray scriptures too. Pinky, you've been praying Jeremiah 29, 11 and 13. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Pray Isaiah 41, 9 and 10. I brought you from the ends of the earth. I called you from its farthest corners and said to you, you are my servant. I did not reject you, but chose you. Do not be afraid. I am with you. I am your God. Let nothing terrify you. I will make you strong and help you. I will protect you and save you. Pray Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Pray all the scriptures that bring you comfort and strength. Ask the Savior to help you. Comfort, strengthen, and keep you. He is willing to aid you. He will carry you through. Friends, remember, grass grows when it is bruised. Remember, find comfort and prayer in the Bible. And lastly, remember, the just shall live by faith. It was 1956, May 5. Your great-grandfather, 
William Clifford Cleveland lay dying in the Riverside Hospital in Nashville, Tennessee. His sons saw that it wasn't long. They took their wives downstairs to the lobby and the three of them, Harold, William, and Earl, went back upstairs for these final moments with their father. When they got there, he looked at them one by one while he raised himself on his elbows in the bed. He looked at them and said, sons, the just shall live by faith. He lowered himself their back, closed his eyes, and was gone. Why did he tell them this? He wanted his sons to know how to live and die with peace and hope. What does it mean to live by faith? It means to live believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the Son of Man. It means to believe that God so loved the world, so loved you, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him, regardless of their past, can have eternal, may not perish, but have eternal life. It means to believe and obey his word. How did he get this faith? Your great-grandfather, that William Clifford Cleveland, did not grow up with his parents. He saw his mother and father for the last time when he was around eight. You see, he was kidnapped. While, his mother, while he was playing in the playground and his mother was cleaning the school where she had a little job as janitor. They changed his name, raised him there in Chattanooga. But when he was old enough, he left that family. Soon after that, he read a book called Bible Readings for the Home Circle. He learned in there that the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ has blessed us in heavenly realms with every spiritual gift in Christ. And that he chose him to be holy and blameless in his sight. That he predestined him and all of us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ. And that he's given up, that in him we have redemption and forgiveness of sins and the riches of God's grace. He saw in there that God made us alive, that even though we were dead in sin, God made us alive in Christ. And by grace that he saved us and raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly places. When he read that, he went on down and saw that by grace we are saved through faith and that we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to, good, to do good works with God, which God prepared in advance for us to do. When he read that, he believed it and began to live by faith. That's how he got his faith. He got it from the Word. He got it from Jesus. He got it from the Holy Ghost who gives it to us as a gift. Now, why did he tell his sons the just shall live by faith? He told them the just shall live by faith because he wanted to see them 
when Jesus comes and he wanted to see their children, their grandchildren, and their wives. He died wanting to see you even though you were not yet born. I can see it now. When Jesus comes with the sound of the trumpet and the voice of the archangel, those who have died in Christ, believing in Christ, will rise from their grave. And your ancestors will rise from the grave. Many Clevelands will be in that group. And when they get in the cloud, William Clifford Cleveland, who said the just shall live by faith, he's going to say, where are my boys? Where are my sons? Where's, where's William? Where's Earl? Where is Harold? Where are your wives? Where are your children? And I can hear each of you say, I'm here. I'm here. Here I am. I am here because you taught me the just shall live by faith. When, we all, when you all get there and you gather under that tree, you're going to just, Michelle is going to lead you all in a song. She's the only Cleveland I've heard sing. <laughs> He's going to lead you all a song and it's going to sound like, say like this, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. And friends, then we'll all lean back and say, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we have no less days to sing God's praise than when than when we first begun. Friends, I challenge you to meet Jesus and your loved ones at the tree of life. If you want to commit to meeting them at the tree of life, I just ask you in these closing moments, to just bow your head and pray, Lord, help me meet, my, meet you and my family at the tree. Thank you, Pastor Norman. <clears throat> On our program, there is to be another number from Sister Edna Daly that we will not hear. We will not be able to um, enjoy her presentation. But we will remind you that there will be an interment of uh, Earl Clifford Cleveland at the Oakwood Memorial Gardens. And following that, there will be a repast in the fellowship hall of this great church. Before the benediction, we want to thank the messenger to this house and for this house, Pastor Deblier Snell, for accommodating us for this the celebration of Earl Clifford Cleveland's life. And now we will hear the benediction from Pastor J. Alfred Johnson, the second. Prior to the benediction, Pinky, I just have to take you back to the late 60s and early 70s when we 
revolutionize the snack shop <laughs> under the auspices of Brother Harry Swinton and Sister Anderson. And we had good fellowship. Who would have known that our fellowship would have even concluded here? I say this to say to you and to every family member that's here, we are here with you. And to those particularly who are visiting from out of town, my wife and I retired here almost two and a half years ago. And um, you come to Huntsville, you're going to come to funerals. You come to Oakwood Church, you're going to come to repass. I need to let you know that Pinky has ministered to the comfort of bereaving families, of grieving families at every funeral that we have attended in the last two and a half years. At that repast, Pinky, Pinky, Oakwood University Church is going to remind you that we are with you, that you are no longer alone. You are not alone. I just had to say that. And so at the conclusion of the benediction, we will return the services to the royal funeral home officials. You may remain seated as we benedict. O oh, loving Lord, we thank you for the privilege of having come into your house, into your presence once more. We present to you a grieving widow and a grieving family. We beg that you would please, through your Holy Ghost auspices, give comfort to these people. May we receive comfort, even in this moment, and from now, hitherto, every time we think of this circumstance, may we receive your blessed comfort. We're getting ready to go over to the, the bone yard right now, where Earl will be planted in the ground as his body stands and sits on that grave, impute and impart an unusual comfort to Pinky's heart, letting her know that one day the trumpet sound will be heard by the dead in Christ, and they shall rise first. Give her hope, give her peace, give her comfort. Let her be comforted by our presence is our prayer. In the blessed name of Jesus Christ. And now, may the grace of God and the sweet communion of his Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with all of us, both now, henceforth, and forevermore, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Amen. And Amen.